Hello, golfers, and welcome back to another episode of the Second Swing Thoughts podcast. I believe it's episode eight now, so we're kind of we're kind of rolling here. Uh, but we have Pierce back, Pierce Lanou, a Sunday Swing writer, up now on the SecondSwing.com blog. If you haven't checked it out yet, um, but we had to talk about the Memorial, and then we'll also talk about um, the Mizuho Open on the LPGA circuit as well. Historic events happening there mm. too, but um, it was a an eventful week for pro golf on kind of the biggest tours. So we have to, we got to get you in here for a, just a quick segment and break things down. But so Victor Hovland is one, we've said his name a lot in here. Yeah. Um, I know you picked him for the PGA <laughs> and he was so close. He had the unfortunate mistake or not really a mistake, more of an unfortunate break yep. on uh, 16 of the bunker there comes back two weeks later and wins a, what, really feels like a major now the memorial right yeah jack makes that course really tough fast firm plays like it did at the pga um so no surprise to see somebody but the ball striking prowess like him he gets out with the putter he contends so um you know he's quickly moving up the ranks i think he's number five now in the world sounds so right. he's quickly becoming or at least approaching the rom scheffler map roy conversation yeah, yeah. and uh i think he Man, he doesn't have the wins that, that those guys do, but right. his game is is just as good, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, and, and this win for him is huge. I think a lot of the the things that that people talk about when they when they talk about Victor Hovland is, well, this guy, yeah, like he's a great player, but he doesn't win. And yeah. this was actually his first win inside of the continental United States. Yeah. I think his three wins prior were. I think he won Puerto Rico one year, and then he might have won in Mexico another yep. time or two. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, people were just kind of waiting, you know, when are you going to win a big tournament? Yeah. Um, he had several close calls. He'd been talking about him, yeah. I mean, over and over. Obviously, the PGA was kind of yeah. the biggest, most recent one, but there had been a, several examples before that. But he, I mean, every week he brings the ball striking. It's mm -hmm. never, he never really has a bad week in that department. He's always, like you said, he... He hits fairways with that pull cut he hits. Yep. He lines up close, hits a cut, and it works every time. Uh, the ball striking is the same as well with the irons. I mean, it's he's throwing darts. It's just the short game has been a little bit more inconsistent in his pro career. This, the, the chipping especially has been a weak point. And then, of course, uh, you know, anybody that gets out the putter is going to have a chance yeah. any week. And so... He was, I think, number three in putting this third week. Third in putting this week, noted. yeah. Yep. If Victor Hovland's finishing third in putting, you're in trouble. Right, yeah. right. And especially because he does, when, I mean, the, the short game, the chipping has been sort of the thing that's holding back the most, I think. Mm -hmm. And if you hit as many greens as he does, it doesn't really matter that much, right? Uh, so that's, and to see him put that clinic on, and he was, th this was one of those tournaments, the board was so bunched yeah. that, Basically, going into the weekend, if you were within six, seven, eight shots, you probably had a chance because right. there was so much carnage out there for some of the guys. I know Hideki was oh. the 36-hole leader, and then I believe he went seven over on the weekend, six over on the yeah, weekend. Yeah, he shot a big score yesterday. I'm not sure what he ended up finishing at. Something, mm -hmm. yeah, seven or eight over for yeah. the weekend after being eight under through 36. Mm -hmm. So it was tough out yeah. there, and I think... Yeah, like like you said, it was so jam packed. Like it wasn't until like the final four holes of the tournament where I was like, oh, like Victor could actually win this thing. Right. Like Denny was holding on to that two shot lead up until two holes to play, and mm -hmm. I actually thought he might he might hang on and do it because he made I think he made like fifteen footers for par on like Dude. sixteen and seventeen. It was unreal to watch him grind out the pars he right did. which by the way he's like the opposite of victor hovland like <laughs> yeah. he, like he's kind of struggles tee to green ball striking's never been you know really amazing but that guy putts like yeah no other it was funny to see the the dichotomy of players at the top yeah because you saw you had denny mccarthy who you know he yeah, most known for putting i think he's mm -hmm. always since he's been on the pga tour he's been a leader in putting and up there near the top of those strokes gain stats but then you had Hovland and you had Scheffler who made that, that weekend charge that they don't really, for the most part, don't make their money with the putter. Right. And so I think it kind of shows that that course can test everything and you need to have everything working for you to win. And, uh, you know, the other name we need to talk about a little bit is Scotty Scheffler. Uh, yeah, because that's a whole, 
for a whole other long story. time Sunday for like an hour or two. You know, he cl- he finished his well. He actually got to seven under and was leading mm-hmm. for a little bit. Um, he ended up in the clubhouse at six under, and for a while that looked pretty good because yeah. of how tough the course was playing. To see, you know, you had I think Wyndham Clark was up there, Hovland obviously, you had McCarthy up there, McElroy was Rory struggling. started the day six under par, and so to see all of them sort of get up to the top and then they'd fall down, and you kind of anticipated that with Denny, and then uh, you really thought Scotty had a chance actually yeah. sitting in there at six under, and <clears> to <throat> do that, losing eight, basically eight and a half strokes with the putter is the most insane like stat I've ever heard. Yeah, I think it's a new record of like the the amount of strokes difference between strokes gain putting and strokes gain total. Yeah. I think he gained like twenty strokes yeah. total. Right. Or I think like it that. was it was for sure over twenty T D green. Yeah, T D green. It, that's what it was. Which, it was it was it was like nineteen point five yeah. T D green minus eight and a half putting. Well I know the difference between Denny putting and Scotty putting was like Insane. Yeah, it was it was Denny like was, double digit strokes yeah. as well. Yeah. Like fifteen strokes or something mm-hmm. difference between yeah, the so, two. And that that's where I was like I was looking on, you know, my social media who I follow and stuff and all the the uh, the media, if you will, of golf and they couldn't find a scenario in the past where one golfer has been number one off the tee, number one approach, and number one short game yeah. in one event. And you have to think if someone does that, they win. Yeah, he was unless they finish dead last in putting, which is what Scott. He was literally like first or second in every statistical Mm -hmm. category other than putting. Yeah, so and it's it's weird because this has been a it's a theme for him now. Mm -hmm. Um, He, I mean, to finish fifteen times in a row now top twelve, which is what he's done. You have to have some really good things going on in your game, and clearly it's that's off the tee. It's the ball and it's the iron play approach play that has been fueling that. And then there are obviously some, he's really good with his short game and he holds out all the time, right? Yeah. So there's obviously that part is there and there's no doubt about it. And we might be seeing one of the best ever T degree stretches in the history of golf. Yep. Um, it's just the guy it struggles when he gets to the greens. And you could argue it's cost him five tournaments in the last yeah. six months. I mean, this week finished one shot out of a playoff last week finished one shot out of a playoff Mm -hmm. the week before was the pga where we kind of talked about really was only the one nine on saturday Mm -hmm. where it was just i mean the weather byron nelson before that byron nelson was was the same thing so Um, yeah i mean at least five tournaments this season where if scotty scheffler putts average he probably wins by three or four i believe he's down to i think outside the top 140 yeah putting yeah i mean this week was bad like and and on sunday he missed like four or five putts within like eight feet and i know he missed one that was like three feet well no he didn't make one all week over 10 feet yeah so it's Um, like you just make one of those you're in a playoff and you think of any you know you go play golf i go play golf um any low handicap mid handicap even getting to higher handicaps throughout 18 holes you might make a putt over 10 feet yeah. right i mean i feel like that's pretty realistic yeah. just to make one i'm not and i'm not a good putter i consider myself <laughs> one of the worst putters probably in the world and um yeah even i mean it seems like even i every once in a while you know they say a blind squirrel finds yeah. a nut every once in a while i roll one in from 15 20 feet but man yeah whatever's going on with the putter for scotty like you have to try to miss everything outside yeah. 10 feet yeah. through 72 holes it's crazy to be yeah. at that i mean I know, I, and that's the thing. When Scotty has the putter kind of working, I mean, he's, he, he won't be beat. So I'm right. sure there'll be a couple more times this year where he shows up, the putter cooperates to some extent, and he yeah. wins by six. I'll be shocked if he uh, if he's not contending on Sunday next week at mm-hmm. the U.S. Open. Yeah. I mean, I really just think I think he's going to go win it by by a handful, yeah. like he said. Again, but, it, literally there's nobody embodies it more when you say if the putter gets hot. Than Scotty Scheffler. Yeah. Uh, so. And I mean, it's so weird to me because last year when he was winning like every week, I don't think he was putting very poorly. I felt no. like his putter was like the strength of his game. Mm-hmm. And then you know for whatever reason, kind of heading into the year this season, it's just kind of gone cold on yeah. him. And he hasn't changed anything. He's using the same putter. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's a, that's an interesting take on the whole situation too. Yeah. So many guys mix with different grips, or they use different putter heads they maybe use the longer putter mm-hmm. they go you know to arm lock they use a mallet instead of a blade i mean then that's one thing he hasn't to my knowledge hasn't 
experimented with at yeah. all is the actual setup of his putter. I thought I might have heard that he was tinkering with one of the phantoms for maybe okay. like a week, but that obviously didn't mm -hmm. didn't you know he didn't stick to that. But yeah, he's been using that same that same blade, Scotty, yeah. for. The last I know two, three Rory's years. an example of someone who yeah. had struggled with putting and tried all kinds of different setups and mm -hmm. putters and still does to this day. Yep. He's always experimenting. JT too. Yep. Yep. There's a bunch so. of guys that, that have, have done that. So yeah, I'll be curious to see if he, if he tinkers with it at all. Mm -hmm. He doesn't strike me as a guy that wants to make equipment right. changes. Like I think he... I mean, I before he, the TaylorMade deal, he had some old clubs yeah. in his bag. I think he kind of understands the ebbs and flows of golf and I think mm -hmm. he knows like... I'm not, you know, he's not far off. Right. Like the putt, like a lot of the putts he hit this week that didn't go in were, were touching the edge of the hole, mm -hmm. which, yeah, I mean, if he gets one or two of those to fall in, it's, yeah, I mean, he it's going to be game so, over. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then Vic made the, the single birdie on 17 mm -hmm. all day to, mm -hmm. you know, end up forcing a playoff and win. So kudos to him. Great win. Um, ping player. He's got ping throughout almost all the bag yep. and i like that he's got i210 irons yeah in the bag i play it some i210 irons okay and uh they are like what four or five years old i think so, so yeah to see a pure striker like him <clears throat> still using those pretty cool and he's got that rusted uh pld putter that, yeah that uh, putter man classic he's... look and he that thing that thing's working for him mm -hmm. uh so you know, We'll see way, way more wins for for Holland yeah. in the future here. Did you did you see Phil Mickelson's tweet on, I on did. Sunday afternoon? I did. Yeah. Well, I mean, what tweet didn't I see from Phil yeah. Mickelson? Yeah, he's, he's, he's touched called, every subject of of golf here lately. I believe on his he called uh, Hovland the favorite at the U.S. Open. So yeah. we'll see. That's not a. I mean, that's not a. I mean, he, the guy. He's number five in the world. He just he's coming off two really really good performances. So, I, I mean, Phil has said a lot of crazy things. But yeah. I think that's a pretty sane thing to say. Yeah. So yeah, he'll be uh, up there, one of the top favorites for sure. We got to move on now to the LPGA mm -hmm. because for it's as much cool. happened on the PGA Tour this week at the Memorial, we had even more history yeah. was made um, in New York at the at Liberty National for the Mizuho Americas Open, hosted by Michelle Wee. Rose Zhang was the big headliner. Well, there was obviously a pretty good field, a lot of stars. But Rose Zhang made her pro debut. She, I mean, basically anything you can accomplish as an amateur golfer, she accomplished. Yep. And then she shows up, wins in her pro debut, which, I mean, delivering on the hype like that, I don't think I've ever seen it before. It's, yeah, it's... It's impressive. It's, it reminds me of Tiger when he came out on tour yeah. because, like, the amount of players I've seen in the last 15 to 20 years that are, you know, supposedly prodigies coming up mm -hmm. as a kid you know they're winning every tournament they play in they're winning every amateur tournament junior tournament you know ajga usga all the way up through and then they get to the the pga tour and it just doesn't happen yeah and it's a completely different ball game so yeah for someone like rose zhang who is it was kind of the same thing she's mm -hmm. been dominant in her amateur career and um to be 20 years old and to say you know, I'm not going to play my last two seasons at Stanford. I'm going to go pro. Like that's like that's risky. Yeah. In my opinion, because it like it, it is a different game. I mean, what if what if you what Let's if take it, there's a lot you can you can name any men or women that transition. It's if you go it, to go from beating you know high level amateurs and college players to beating pros that are the best of the best. Most of the time is not an easy transition. Oftentimes no. it takes months or years. Yeah. for players to get into that and sometimes they never even do win yep and then for her to right away i mean she there was the poise the confidence like it was there was never a, a moment where there was she appeared to have doubts or mm -hmm. appeared to be sort of timid in the situation was it 70 69 66 yep. in the first three rounds yep. sunday you could kind of see the nerves a little bit mm -hmm. i don't think she made a birdie all day sunday um a lot of gritty pars shot a couple right. over but which in itself is something that is, is you know a mature thing to absolutely to have, and even it was kind of similar to the augusta national women's amateur yeah. where she kind of struggled on yep. sunday just didn't have quite the swing that day but yep. she scored what she needed to score to survive and eventually win. yeah it was the same thing you're right yeah at augusta she you know she shot i think a few over and then mm -hmm. was in the playoff and was able to yeah. kind of you know they talked about that mental toughness that's that's right. you got to be mentally tough for sure in that situation i mean to think about being 20 years old 
and just come yeah. out on your first professional event right. and win the thing is, I was so impressed. And that yeah. shot she hit in the playoff, the mm -hmm. second shot on the second playoff hole, I don't know what club that was, probably like, like a, a five seven wood or, or a five yeah, wood, something, something like, like that. that. <sighs> Man, that was just so also, impressive. Talk about a silky smooth golf swing. Mm -hmm. that it doesn't look like anything can go wrong when right. you watch it, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I think it's almost, for me, it's changing my perspective, at least a for sure in the women's game, maybe in the men's game, but not quite as much. But when someone is a dominant amateur, like she, you know, she was almost winning every time she went out and played. It was at least, if she was losing, it was, she was finishing top five and top 10 and still yeah. play events routinely. It's almost making me reconsider where they rank among the pros, right? Because a dominant amateur like her, I think she needs to be regarded when she steps onto the pro scene as one right. of the favorites right away. Yeah. Right. And now moving forward, if there's a, you know, in the men's or women's game, if someone has a resume like that as an amateur and steps into the program, I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's going to be, to to me, I'm going to be like, yeah, this, they, they can win this thing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think uh, a guy that, that might be similar comparison to that is uh, Ludwig Ebert. Yes. Mm -hmm. He's coming out soon here. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's an exciting time for golf and for, for young golfers. And um, another thing that was cool about um, that tournament this week is for the first time ever the LPGA had that's right the juniors the top 24 ranked juniors um, got to tee it up with the, with the pros and and have their own little competition this week yeah. so I thought I thought that was super cool right. and, they, and they did a good job of showing that on on Sunday on the mm -hmm. broadcast because I flipped that on after yeah. after the memorial and uh, you know following had, the low junior yep, and stuff yep. like that and they had yeah. Anna Davis who you know won the Augusta pro am last year. Right. As a 16 year old mm -hmm. she was out there playing and um the low the low junior ended up being yana wilson who's yeah. another one of these kind of Prodigies. prodigy yeah. type young players that wins pretty much every tournament she plays she's 15 she's gonna be playing in the u.s open mm -hmm. at pebble beach in a month mm -hmm. so super cool yeah a lot yeah. of cool that stuff is going really on. cool initiative cool uh, uh kudos to michelle wee for yeah that event and what it's turned mm -hmm. into and and it's really gr moving the game forward quite a bit yeah so. for sure um well i think you know for now we'll, we'll wrap because mm -hmm. we do have more big golf events coming up you mentioned the u.s women's open the u.s open is gonna be father's day weekend and we'll be all over that here as well so for sure uh, but pierce uh once again if you aren't reading the sunday swing you should uh we publish it every week on the Second Swing blog. Pierce recaps all of the action from the weekend. So, Pierce, thanks for taking the time. Absolutely. Uh, discussing, really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. All right, we now welcome back in Larry Bobka. Uh, I know for the viewers and the listeners of the first time Larry was on, uh, we kind of hyped up multiple parts to this whole thing. And I don't, I don't really see it a reason to end it either we can just keep going well, it's uh, fine yeah so and we'll it's just fine. we'll do one of these uh, every month two months whenever it works out but um so we had a lot of people sending comments and some thoughts to you uh, about just their either their game or just in general the golf random equipment industry. random golf stuff yes golf stuff perfect um, and there really isn't anybody better to answer those questions than you so but uh First of all, we're now into the summer yep. since the last time we did this. So, right. uh, I, I mean, I know you've had uh, an injury that you're dealing with, but is are you out and playing golf now, or I have, I yeah. have, I've played a few rounds. Uh, like I said earlier, I managed to managed to scrape it around for 75 at Chaska Town Course, which yeah. you know it's not the hardest golf course in the world, but it's also not the easiest. No, I, hey, I've played it. I mean, once they played this year. the state open there a couple of years ago. Right. So, yeah, no, it's uh, no, I enjoy it. No, I'm just dealing with them, you know, as as I've aged, dealing with some stenosis and arthritis in my back. So, um, actually, Thursday I have a tea time with the surgeon to uh, try to deaden some of the nerves, and nice. uh, we're hoping that's going to help, and you know, it'll make it'll make golf a little more enjoyable. What uh, it actually, I mean, the heart it it doesn't really bother full swings. The closer I get to the green, the more bent over I am, the more oh, it bothers me. So yeah, so so short game and putting is is not Makes you know, sense. I I pretty much take a look at it, just hit it, and don't don't yeah. really don't really overanalyze the shot right now. So my short game is probably a, is as bad as it's ever been right mm. now because of that. Can't be that bad if you're shooting seventy five, you know. So. Well, no, I hit a lot of fairways and greens yeah, too. Yeah, I know you do. 
Uh, what are you? What is in the bag right now? Anyway, like as, I know you've said before, there's multiple variations of what you yeah, play. Yeah, there's so. there's a lot of variations in the bag right now. Actually, I'm I'm kind of I've, I've kind of thrown. Actually, played last week with 14 clubs, which that's, is a rare, that's, which that's, is a rarity yeah, for, for me. You. But I'm kind of trying to decide. You know, for me, around 10 or 11 clubs is really what I need. I mean, I don't drive it that far anymore. I mean, it's just the reality of getting older and. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I kind of look at I kind of look at my set based on, OK, after driver, you go to three wood and just kind of gap something every 15 yards. And, and for me, about 10 or 11 clubs mm. fits the bill. But, you know, I've gotten a few new things from Callaway and pulled a few old things out. You know, I have my own stuff, too. Right, right. Uh, Todd Dempsey's made me, you know, mm. made me a seven wood and some other things. So I'm just kind of, you know, I haven't had a chance because of the back problem. I, I haven't had a chance to go hit golf balls, you know, and usually that's where yeah. I pare it down is, you know, go, go to the range and hit some shots and figure out how far they fly. So I haven't been able to do that. So, um, but yeah, I think I'm pretty close, you know, once the back gets a little better, I'm pretty close to pulling out where I'm going to go with, yeah. you know. You know, I kind of look at it, I mean, one of my favorite things is kind of like three metals or three woods, if you're going to use wood woods, yeah. uh, three irons and three wedges. Seems to be okay. a good, seems to be a good, you know, for me, gets me that kind of 15 yard gaps that I need. And, yeah. and so, yeah, we'll, we'll be back to that here shortly, nice. but it's kind of fun playing around and, you know, as, as you know, we've got... We haven't released them yet, but we have wedges coming, mm -hmm. you know, for the LB line. So I've, you know, I've had the 48, the 52, the 56, and the 60 in the bag, which I normally don't carry all those wedges. All four. Yeah, yeah, but just trying them out and yeah, why not? playing and practicing with them a little bit. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you you designed them, so why not go out and try them? So uh, yeah, it's yeah. kind of, it's kind of <laughs> yeah, it's kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So the purpose here today is we just have. I think I have about six, seven questions Perfect. from listeners, from viewers. Uh, so we'll get your perspective on those. And I think a lot of the, I picked these questions too because they do relate not just to that one person, but right. they will be helpful, your answers to everybody that okay. you know, is watching Perfect. or listening. But um, I wanted to start off on a topic I know you're passionate about. So uh, this is my own question for you. And I Certainly. mostly just because I know I've had conversations with you about this before. But, right. Um, your thoughts on center shafted putters? <laughs> well, you don't see a lot of them out on the PGA Tour. Yeah. All right. You see a few guys. You know, uh, right now Luke Donald's putting with a center shafted putter. Big Odyssey Mount mm -hmm. with a center shaft. You know, maybe one, arguably one of the best short game putting guys ever. Um, here's the problem with it. Okay. So you take this wonderful mallet. Yeah. That's designed for high moment of inertia. And we know moment of inertia is the resistance to twist. Mm -hmm. Okay. A blade putter is about 55,000 to 5,500 in resistance to twist. You know, some of the Odyssey mallets, some of the even, I mean, they get over 8,000. Mm -hmm. So they're very stable. Now, why would you stick a shaft in the middle of that and cause it to be unstable? Okay, you're you're asking for. I mean, go take an old, a Kushnet bullseye that right. you know we have a bunch of them. People turn them mm -hmm. in all the time. I have a bunch of them at home. My dad loved to putt with bullseyes. You got to hit it right in the center of that, otherwise it's going to twist and you're not going to hit a very good putt. Right. So for me, you're taking away you're taking away what the engineer's designing into that putter to help you. So that's why I don't like center shaft. And it's a rare, to me, it's a rare person that really needs a center shafted putter. Yeah, it might be an alignment thing. Uh, it's an alignment thing. They have issues kind of lining up where they hit the ball. You know, a lot yeah. of people, a lot of people come in and they like to hit the ball off the toe of the putter because mm -hmm. that looks like the right place. Well, center shaft might bring them to hitting it more in the center yeah. of the putter. But again, you're taking that stability away. So I'm not, I'm not a fan of it. I want to give you, if, 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 if you're going to come in for a putter fitting, I want you to walk out the door with one, a putter that looks good to you. Two, it's going to be fit right to you yeah. because 
of my experience and our Quintech technology. And I want you to go out and be able to putt out in the real world. You know, hey, it's just like fitting a driver. You know, we fit a putter indoors. You, you got to take out in the real world. Right. Right. And in the real world, we tend to be not quite as good as we are indoors. Yeah. So I want a putter that, gee, Drew, if you're going to miss it a little on the toe or miss it a little heel, we're not going to get funky roll off that. Yeah. Yeah. I think so, for me, in, in testing center shafted putters before I knew you right. before, it was always a, a feel thing. Cause I always I feel like it's firmer too. It's yeah. more firm because the shaft is in the center yeah. there, and I never liked that. Right. Um, but yeah, I I mean, what you say totally makes sense, right? I mean, if you put the center of gravity more forward, right there where the shaft is, it'll twist more than the the way. It, well, and think about and, this too. If 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 the shaft goes into into the head. Now I've got a more difficult time to adjust the loft on that because I have to bend that shaft. Yeah, true. I, okay, if it's got a stem on it, at least we got a chance to bend some to bend some loft out of it. So I mean, honestly, it's just to me, it's just not, it's just not the most stable putter mm -hmm. there is. There's there's a lot better, and especially if, for somebody who struggles making a good stroke, I mean you're way better off with a nice mallet that's mm -hmm. back weighted high moi um, double bend yeah. shaft that gives you face band i mean that's your best chance if you really struggle with putting to make a good yep. solid roll every time yeah and to really see your putting numbers improve yeah kind of right away just yeah. from an equipment change is probably going if you well, if you struggle with it to go from a you know low MOI or maybe a, a small blade that's not designed for forgiveness necessarily right. to go into something that's a big mallet and you know like you said double bend um, well, designed it, for forgiveness there well and it's also as we know I mean the three most important things in putting are speed speed and speed yeah so if I if it's coming off the putter more solid even when I make a bad stroke now I got a chance I mean I, I fit a guy from 3M today, who's actually playing in the Pro Am, an executive oh, sure. at 3M, and had a bunch of old golf clubs, you know. And he goes, and so fit him into a new set of tailor-made irons, and then he, I brought a ping driver, and he's like, "Why?" And I said, "Because it's the most forgiving driver there is." Mm -hmm. I mean, he hit it, you know, you, you know, we can see impact, and yeah. I mean, he hit it all over the face, and this thing's going straight, and he's like, "Oh my gosh, this is wonderful." <laughs> Do they make fairway woods too? <laughs> you know, but but that's, you know, here's a guy that plays nine. He's like you say, I play nine to twelve times a year. Most of it's corporate, most of it, but I like to play golf, and I probably play better if I had better equipment. Yeah. Well, he walked out the door being really excited about the driver. Plus, it got him more distance than his old Nike Sumo. Yeah. You know, so he hit it farther with more forgiveness. I mean, that's what we're all about. And maybe he'll play more golf now that he that, knows he's going to Now play. he's going to play more golf. Right. He, get, You know, he said his son's into it now, so he's going to go out and play some more golf. Yeah, i like to hear that. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that's it's it all is, it all relates to each other, right? I mean, putter, right. driver, the whole design of the club, the MOI perspective, the bigger with the more weight behind the face, more forgiving it's going to be. That's yeah. just kind of well, the, the, the science of, of golf clubs. You know, I've got a new putter coming too that we will introduce here okay. in the next couple months. I mean, you've seen it. It's it's you know it's a, it's a eighty eight oh two style and yeah. shafted blade. Well, you know, with my assistant coaching at at Minnesota, you know, a month and a half ago, I brought it out, and kids are playing a practice round at at TPC Twin Cities and. They looked at it and they're like, oh my gosh, what are you going to do with that? And I said, well, I'm going to hit some practice putts. I just, you know, yeah. this is article number one. I want to hit it. They hit a couple putts and they're like, oh my God, I'm scared to death of this thing. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, there's no there's no forgiveness. Right. But on the other side of that, if you want to really improve your putting, you got to challenge yourself a little yeah. bit. I mean, why did Tiger always practice with a persimmon driver? and then play metal in tournaments mm -hmm. because he wanted to become a better ball striker and he knew that if he practiced with right. a difficult the, driver the room for error is a lot smaller the room for error 
why not? I mean, that's kind of like I talk about the LB1 irons. I mean, it might not be your set of irons all the time, but why not have a set of irons that when you go to the range, if I'm serious about this game, why wouldn't I practice with them? Why wouldn't I try right. them? And then when I go play, I might not necessarily play them all the time, but I become a better ball striker. I mean, it's just like, you know, there's so many people now that, they, I mean, they've never even hit a persimmon wood. Yeah. And you find out, man, those guys in the past must be really good. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> excuse me. No, no worries at all. So Sponsor, Sponsored by Mountain Dew. <laughs> <laughs> Diet Mountain Dew, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, got my, I got my water down here, too, with my own name on the, on the mug. Oh, where'd it go? I lost it. Um, so, all right. Next one here from, from Jeff. Um, yeah. This is a pretty good one, I think. I like this question. Um, in your career, the biggest one-year advancement in club technology that you've seen? The one year? Yeah, so, you know, or maybe just the one, you know, idea or a technology or, or phase maybe it was that really jumped things forward and maybe it is the I guess I have an idea of what you might answer here but wow you know I, I would say probably metal woods yeah you know mm -hmm. I mean if you look back I mean I remember in I remember in my freshman year of college which was like a hundred years ago um, was using wood drivers and um, my pro in the golf course I worked at said, hey, um, I set it up where you can go the, you can go to TaylorMade, which was in McHenry, Illinois at the time, and I was in Illinois. Hey, set it up and, and they're going to get you a driver and a three wood. So Vale Adams, who was a PGA Pro at the time, the, the dad of Gary Adams, who started TaylorMade, you know, took care of me and, and you know, you went and, I brought, and all of a sudden you're like, man, this is, this is different, you know, mm -hmm. it's a little bit, and we're still talking about little headed right, right. stainless steel clubs, but you could see that there was a major change and then, you know, the heads got a little bit bigger and you know, I went to work. I went to work for Wilson at the time and designed the Ultra Tour Metal Woods. But we also were hanging on the Woodwoods and did the Whale. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, you know, after I left there and went to help start UST, then the original Big Bertha showed up. Yeah. And you're like, wow, this is a game changer. This is a game changer for people that have always struggled hitting a driver. Now all of a sudden, the driver's getting in the air. Mm -hmm. The ball's flying there's forgiveness so you could kind of see it so I yeah I would say in from a club side standpoint it would definitely be it would yeah. definitely be metal woods yeah I think even just visually looking at if you were to look at the bag of someone on I mean whether it's on tour or it's someone at the local muni from like 1978 right, and right. you're gonna see a lot of wood woods you're gonna see irons wedges putters. right the biggest visual difference too is probably going to be the driver versus you yeah because the, the 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 irons you might see it look similar and obviously there's going to be differences but it'll look similar uh the putter might depending if it's a mallet blade whatever but the driver will be this small wood club head yeah now it's 460 cc metal with you know the adjust adjustability on the hosel or the you know whatever it might be that I mean, visually, it's so different now. Yeah, in the 80s, for sure. I mean, you know, you still had guys hanging on the Woodwoods as mm -hmm. drivers, still hitting their persimmon drivers. But then, you know, the a popular tour bag was was their persimmon driver, a tailor-made tour spoon, mm -hmm. and then when the railers came out, yeah. you know, a 16 or a 19-degree railer because they were so versatile. They were a little bit more forgiving than than a persimmon would. I mean, you know, I played, I played a, a 1952 Tommy Armour 693 three wood through high school, through college, till the time that I was a club pro. And then when I went to work for Wilson, I mean, I played this, I played this club for a good solid 10 years. And yeah. even some of the years that I was at Wilson till I designed my own three wood, that was, yeah. that was, 
you know, I kind of hung on to it. So, yeah. I mean, it had, I played it for 10 to 13 years yeah. because it would, because it worked so well, you know, but then, but you saw guys changing out clubs, you know, changing out now, putting metal, metal fairways in. Right. And that's where, and then when all of a sudden now it was like they'd play with somebody else who had a metal driver and all of a sudden the metal driver's going a long way then those started to go those started to go away and then right. you know being a titleist and you know 975d was a game changer yeah yeah and you know i got we got justin leonard out of his persimmon wood got davis love the last guy yeah, out he was of his last one right yeah out of his persimmon wood which you know that was that was a big deal and i got a real quick story on that if you want to hear that absolutely so, so congressional us open sure trying at davis now, um, Justin Leonard had just won the Kemper Open with his Titleist 975D. So there's one guy left. There's Davis. Had made him multiple clubs. He played a lot of practice rounds with Mike Holbert, who I played. I played mini tours with back in you know back in the early 80s. And so I show up there, and all of a sudden we're going to walk the practice round, and Davis has got his Woodwood, but he's got a 975D in the bag, and I'm like. Which one is that that yeah. I made you? He goes, oh no, this is this is this is this is Hubby's backup driver. He goes, I hit it on the range the other day, and he I hit it so good, and he goes, I'm going to try it. So now we walk the practice round, and while you line, you know, the CEO of, of Title has walked the first nine holes, and Davis is hitting these drives, and his there's about 15 yards difference. So the first one we walked down to, and Wally's like, oh, I, you know, I think I think this is going to be bad because, you know, his wood driver is 15 yards longer than the metal. No, the 975D was 15 yards longer. Yeah. So now, plays it on Tuesday, plays it on Wednesday, he's going to tee it up on Thursday. So I'm flying back Thursday morning from, you know, Washington to San Diego thinking, man, I have just, this is cool. I got him out of it. Somewhere about Denver, somewhere in the middle of the country, I'm like, oh boy, what if he drives it bad? Because they're going to make a big deal that he's, that he, this right. first tournament, he's decided to use this metal driver. Yeah. If he drives it bad. It's the U.S. Open. Yeah, and it's the U.S. Open. If he <laughs> drives it bad, I mean, this is a disaster. So some, some, so somewhere there, somewhere there was, there was a couple of vodkas had somewhere over Denver and Arizona <laughs> and you know got home and, and it's like oh, and he played good and they talked to him about him and he was in it since then but yeah I mean that was you know guys like that were hard mm -hmm. you know to change into metal but once they saw it once they saw the advantages of yeah. it you know right it, I mean at some point you can't deny how much you're missing out on right you you can't you can't deny you can't deny the speed mm -hmm. you know and especially then pro v1 wasn't there they were still playing the professional golf ball so you're pl still playing a softer golf ball but you're seeing lower spin you're seeing more distance you're seeing you're in, in you're seeing the you're seeing the the advantage of metal on the miss hits mm -hmm. man I really didn't feel like I hit it that solid and all of a sudden it's it's still in the fairway. Yeah. You know, right. and if you're doing that for a living, you better be playing right. out of the fairway. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, here's a wedge one now. We'll shift gears to wedges okay. here. This is from Harry Mason. Um, it says, for steep swingers, is leading edge relief more important than bounce, especially if you're not prone to opening the club face? Is leading edge relief more important than the bounce if you don't open the club face? No, no, no. You always want to have bounce. I mean, you always want you always want the club to come in and cut through the turf. Okay, the bounce is the thing that's going to keep it going. Okay, the leading edge is maybe going to dull it a little bit, but it's never going to do as much as the bounce does to keep that club coming through. So if I'm steep and I'm coming down like this, if I don't have any bounce, 
well, what's going to happen? I'm just going to stick it in yeah, the ground. Yeah, it's going to stay in the ground. Yeah, it's going to stay in the ground. You're going to hit a wedge, especially. You're going to hit high in the face, mm -hmm. and you kind of get that. You kind of get that rainbow shot that's yeah. got no spin on it, and it lands by the flag and it runs off because right. it's got no spin. So you always want the bounce to keep that club moving, so you're making impact around the third or fourth groove which is usually on a good wedge is where the center of gravity mm -hmm. is. So that's where you get maximum spin and the correct flight. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so bounce is always, I mean, we always laugh, we, you know, I've been saying this for years, bounce is your friend. I yeah, mean, oh, it, yeah. really, it really is. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see on tour, you see a lot of wedges in, in their firm conditions, guys play with a lot of bounce. You know, they might pull, they might have a little bit of, of toe and heel or, 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 you know, back of the back of the sole relief, but there's still a lot of bounce. Right. You know, I remember Seve for years when I was at Wilson. I mean, he'd come in at the Western Open. He always we'd always make him three or four different wedges, and we had these big mats around the around the grinding wheels, and he would just take a wedge and he'd hit it on the mat and we would grind the wedge till it hit right in the center of the sole. Wow. So he was he was less concerned about what the leading edge was doing and he was totally concerned that he made contact in the center of the sole on that on that right. mat. That was when the wedge, that was when the grind was perfect for him. Mm. Interesting. I guess that's how it was tested back then, you know? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, that Hey, we didn't have any track man. We didn't have right. we didn't have any, you know, guys did it guys did it by feel. They uh -huh. did they did it by sight. Was it coming out the correct right. way? Uh, you know, and he took a little he took a little back edge and heel relief because I mean, he just played with a 55. I mean, he was just he was a master of Right, as we as we know. I mean, yeah. He, he was he was fabulous. You go find a highlight reel of Sevy and it's he's always some sort of magnificent short game shot. Oh, yeah. there's <laughs> a YouTube, there's a YouTube video of him doing like a little short game, short game clinic, short game lesson. I think he, I think he knocks it in the hole like three times or four <laughs> times. And I'm guessing it didn't take very much. You know, I'm sure right. it's edited, but I'm sure it didn't take very many oh, yeah. shots for him to do that. There might, there probably isn't a better short game player in the history of, of the game. No, not really. There can't be. Not um, really. On that same note, I'm going to actually skip down to one I have right. on the bottom of the list, but it's kind of a wedge uh, question as well from Calvin, asking, is it better to have the same wedge bounce and grind throughout your whole set, or would you prefer to have different bounces through your, for uh, example, your three wedges you might have? I like, I like to vary them. Okay. And here's the reason why. Okay, if you, if you have the same bounce, now I don't have as much versatility. So if I go play your golf course yeah and there's a lot of sand in there mm -hmm. you know my 58 or 60 or 50 whatever your wedge setup is if i don't have enough if i don't have enough bounce on my 60 i'm not going to get out so if i have a 54 or a 52 that's got a lot of bounce man i can use that and still go play in the bunkers right. you know i think we get the mindset sometimes that we've got hey my lofted wedge is my bunker club no, every wedge is your bunk. Every wedge you have in your right. bag is your bunker clump, based on the condition. I mean, if I'm hitting a long bunker shot, I'm hitting it. I'm not hitting it with sixty degrees. Right, you probably need a fifty, fifty-two, or something like that. Yeah, you know, I've I've kind of gone. I've always played a fifty-six. Right now in the bag, I have I have forty-eight, fifty-three, and fifty-nine. Okay. So I've kind of gone back. Yeah. I've kind of gone back to my 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 college and early playing days lofts. Um, but that 53's got more bounce than the 60 does. Okay, so if I'm playing out of firm bunkers, yeah, I'm going to use the 60 most, or the 59. Yeah. I'm going to use the 59. But if I'm playing out of, a, I'm hitting a longer bunker shot out of softer sand, or even if I'm playing it, I'll hit that 53 out of the bunker. I can roll that thing open. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I, yes, I, I think it makes sense to have wedges different plus with the 53 i'm going to hit that more from the fairway mm -hmm. so i want more bounce on that because i i need that thing i need that thing to go through the turf for this kind of almost full swing not full swing, for, yeah, but, but, you know, yeah for fuller swings yeah. 
I mean, that's kind of my wedge, you know, kind of my wedge layup yardage is about 90 yards. Yeah. And for me, that that's, you know, that's all I hit it, you know. And these days, it's like, it's I got to swing harder to get far. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, at 63 years old, your game get your game turns interesting. Yeah. I can tell you that. Well, yeah, I mean, the... The thing I'm learning is, is I, I would honestly just, this is kind of a sidetrack, but I, the thing I would have never picked up is playing not 14 clubs. Yeah. When I got to that age, yeah. I would have never thought of that. But I mean, it makes total sense the way well, you yeah, cause, it. Well, yeah, because you're just not, you're just not hitting them far. Right. You know, you gotta- uh, well, and, and then and the distances are gonna pile on top of each other, I imagine. Well, yeah, I mean, my, my playing partner, you know, I got in the cart and he looked at my bag and he's like, holy cow, he goes, that's a lot of clubs for you. And I said, well, yeah, just, you know, doing a little clump testing. But I just, to me, it's about the shot, okay? And if a PGA Tour player drives the ball 300 or 320 yards, okay, from you go to that 320 yards to his last club where he maybe hits his 60, 90 to 100 yards, mm -hmm. okay, that's, what, 220 yards of distance? Yeah. Well... If I only hit my driver, if I only carry my driver and right now, if I carry my driver 220 right now, that's a lot. Hopefully after Thursday, it'll be a little farther again. But I can hit that, if I carry that driver 220 and rolls out to 240, so let's say I'm at 240 and I can hit my last wedge, I hit my last wedge about 75 yards. I mean, that's less distance. Mm -hmm. Fewer clubs what, need to, to fill. Fewer clubs need to fill because then there's a lot of redundancy. So that's why when we come in for fittings, somebody comes in for a fitting and, and, and they're in that distance range. Well, hey, how's your bunker play? If you want to play 14 clubs, let's give you something a little more utility, a little more variety in your mm -hmm. wedge game. Or, hey, you play a golf course where there's a lot of forced carries. Maybe a seven or a nine wood needs to go in that bag that, hey, it might go as far as your five iron or your four iron, but it's going to have a different trajectory right. to it. Mm -hmm. You know, you've, you've got to play, you got to put in your bag what works for your golf course. Yep. And so that's why, you know, yeah, I've, right. I've kind of gotten to the point where it's like, Okay, if I got 15 yard gaps, I'm pretty comfortable. Right. This isn't to say someone with, that may hit the ball 220, 230 right. driver can't have 14. Right. It's just to make sure that there's a use for all 14. You yeah, there's a basic there's a basic amount of clubs to get us from 230 to, you know, 80 yards or 100 yards. Yeah. But then let's find stuff in between that's going to work that's going to really help for those your, unique scenarios where there is a carry to form. Yeah. Maybe it's maybe it's two high lofted, you know, high two wedges at fifty eight degrees, and one's a high bounce one for bunkers, one's a lower bounce one or whatever it is. Um, yeah, no, definitely. So okay, another fun one here. Uh, I got the, I thought this one was very curious, especially now with, uh, you know, it was a good one because there's tour players that have contracts with brands and stuff right. like that. So, um, your thoughts on brand loyalty versus a mixed bag of brands? Tour players had their contracts, but um, does it benefit the average player to have the same brand all the way through their bag, um, or do, should they mix it up? Wow. Well, let, let's see. Let's take the, the, the most winningest guy on the PGA Tour champions is Bernhard Langer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he's got to deal with he's got to deal with Tour Edge now, but he won most of his most, won most of his event. And here's the bag of clubs. He had a ping driver. Taylor made three wood. Adams, two Adams hybrids mm -hmm. at like 18 and 22. He had a Ben old Ben Hogan four iron that he used. Had an old Ben Hogan five iron that he used. He had Adams golf six through nine iron. Had a Taylor made pitching wedge. Had a Cleveland 56 and a Vokey 60. And, That's about and every... Obviously, I mean, that, you know, what's that? Eight different brands? You think, you think of golf brands, you bought, named all of them. Yeah, I mean, you know, here's a guy that's got a bag full of stuff. Yeah. But it goes exactly where it's supposed to go. Yeah. Uh, to me, the, the core thing you have to do is 
whatever your set of irons is, whether it starts at five iron, it starts at four iron, you know, some people, rarely do we have three irons anymore because lofts are stronger right. now. But if you're talking about your core set for the average guy with average speed, five iron through pitching wedge, yes, you, you want them as uniform as you can. You know, we fit you, you order them in, they're going to be consistent. Yeah. Okay. From there, all bets are off. Yeah. It's whatever works best. Mm -hmm. Why, why not? And the best part is there are so many options so that yeah. there's going to be, there's going to be one that works best for you. Right. So if I've got, if I've got a five, say I got a five through nine iron or five through pitching wedge, say I got a set of ping I two thirties. Okay. Mm. Well, I don't have to go ping wedges. Right. I can, I can fill in with Vokey 50, 56 and 60 or 50, yeah. 54 and 58 because arguably they're the best on the market mm -hmm. right now, okay? Why wouldn't I put those in the bag? Ping makes a great set of irons. Now, let's find the driver that works best. Yeah. I don't care if it's, you know, depending on the person's launch conditions, I don't care if it's a Ping, I don't care if it's a TaylorMade, I don't care if it's a Titleist, I don't care if it's, um, who'd I miss? Ping, Titleist, Callaway, TaylorMade, mm -hmm. Cobra, right. Strixon, you know, they're, they're, they're all in the mix to try out for somebody. So why wouldn't I put the best driver in there? Now, depending on, on what they do fairway wood wise, yeah. where are we going to go? Mm -hmm. You know, a more lofted fairway wood has become a popular thing to right. play. Mm -hmm. You know, you see a lot of guys on tour because the ball spins less, the club spins. So, if I go driver, driver, lofted three wood, seven wood, or something, or you know hybrid, why not? Why not try the best that's out there? Right. And if you hit the best, what's the difference? Now, what happens though, when we do a fitting, is, hey, you're not going to have a heavy shafted driver and a light shafted three wood. You know, we're 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 aware that we're trying to get this progression of, hey, maybe it's a 65 gram driver shaft. Then you really want to go to kind of a 75 or 80 right. gram three wood shaft, maybe the same in the seven wood or maybe a little heavier. And then you go a little heavier in the pitch or heavier in a hybrid maybe. Yep. So we're cognizant that, that even though they're different brands, they match up in a good progression of yeah. overall weight in the golf club. So somebody's going to play well. Right, right. No, it's kind of like Langer in that old four and five Hogan in the, in the six through the six through nine iron and Adams, you know, he played Hogan apex four iron shafts forever. Well, he's going to have the shaft in those heads in the length and the swing weight and the lie angles are going to match up. So, there's, yeah. They might be different manufacturers, but it really is a set of clubs. Yeah, it's ultimately where the ball goes and how it gets there. Yeah, if it, if it gaps correctly. Right. So, uh, and as you can find out in the fitting, you know, th the different brands have their own different looks and feels and some technology differences, right. but it the ball is gonna go a certain distance for you and travel a certain way slightly differently with each club right. and so it's the one that works yeah that. i mean hey it worked for titleist for 19 years trust me you know for 19 years you know every club in your bag better be a titleist and what's wrong <laughs> with you if you don't do well if you don't if you don't believe in the product why would you work there i mean that's you know yeah so i mean it's kind of like you know i've said before working here that's why i believe in second swing so much because we do so much to help golfers yeah you know and we have all these options now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll be honest, there's fittings back in the day with Titleist that, hey, did we have the best design three wood or hybrid? Yeah, maybe not. Mm -hmm. You know, did we have the best driver at the time? No, well, maybe not. You know, and then again, for that certain player, maybe not. I now can walk out and grab a whole bunch of fitting heads. Right. And start throwing shafts and throwing and go, you know what, Mr. Smith? I got four drivers from four different manufacturers. Yep. 
let's and let, let's, in all the let's fittings, dial it in and all the fittings you've done too you have a feeling too on which ones tend to rise to the top in fittings uh you know based on maybe it's based like a, on how on, that based on, on how player, that yeah. player hits their right. golf absolutely yeah you know when i walk i mean the guy the guy this morning you know he, he's like wow you did that for, well i've been doing this for 42 years yeah i understand the ball i understand what you need i understand that you need you need something that launches high spins he had he had a fair amount of speed i mean it was 107 108 miles an hour club head speed, speed with yeah. the driver so yeah, he wasn't he wasn't slow by any right. stretch had a driver with a shaft that was too light and too soft you know so all those things that all of a sudden i'm watching this i'm going to walk out there and he's like man that's really you know you did this pretty fast, and I'm like, well, yeah, it's not my first day. Right. And he sees right away on the numbers. He, he sees. Yeah, you know, and that's that's why going to going and coming to us, people get, you know, people like coming to us because, one, we don't waste our time, but we also spend a hell of a lot of time talking about it. probably shouldn't say hell. A uh, <laughs> hell of a lot of the time talking amongst their fitting, fitters and training amongst their fitters that when these when players come in and and you know that's why we're so yeah. good at that's why we're so if good they, at what we do any question that a you know and i don't want to make this a commercial for no, second no, no. swing but I, you know that's the fact of the matter yeah that's who we are yeah yeah it's it's uh i mean any question a, a customer could possibly you know conceivably come up with right we're supposed to have the answer that's right. the that's the purpose of all the training right that the fitters all do is you know, I mean, there shouldn't be a question that they're possibly an or asked yeah. that they can't answer. Um, so. Well, I, I mean, uh, here I'll give you a perfect of craziness. I had the long snapper from the University of Minnesota come in, okay. football player. Yeah. You know, strong, very strong in the legs. Didn't really have the best golf swing in the world. I mean, he had a five iron that carried 245 and rolled out <laughs> to 280. A five iron. <laughs> I'm sitting there going. And he looks at me and he's like, is that any good? And it's like, I've never seen that before. <laughs> I mean, this is like long drive guy kind of yardage. Yeah. You know, but I ended up getting him into a set of clubs and actually he doing some comfortable with a driver, but we had a utility three iron from Ping that he hit with a, you know, a, uh, an 80 X graphite set that he hit anywhere from 265 to 290 yards straight <laughs> yeah who needs a driver right, <laughs> right and right. he does any you know he's a football player yeah and he walked out the door he has set of iron some way he, he was happy because he could you yeah, know he go on the course but and... there's there's a really unique fit right right you know, i did have him hit a few drivers and they went a long way but they also went a long way <laughs> sideways yeah too, yeah because he really didn't have a golf a, a really you know grooved golf swing right. to hit drivers so you know i mean we see a lot we see oh, a man. lot of stuff oh i yeah that's it, a lot of things are, are done in those stores yeah. so uh all right from eugene the most influential golf club design of all time oh boy there's a couple well, that come to my mind just in the, the golf history that i know but of course you got a little more of a fingerprint on what it, do you so. think you, do, you tell me first my first thought was the answer okay that was my first, my yep. first thing that came to my mind was yep. the answer putter from, from Ping. Yep. What, what else is on your mind? Uh, well, there's, well, I guess. I in, like, I like being in the interview yeah, asking yeah. you. So uh, there's the cavity back iron. Is yep. that, is that, would that count as one? Kind oh, of? Yep. Um, I would say here, here's what I would say. Okay. Definitely you're right on the Ping putter. Yeah. Okay, because up to that point, everything was was a blade. Yep. There was no forgiveness. I mean, that was the first putter that really created forgiveness. Kind of the, the heel-toe waiting part Heel and toe waiting, and yep. it was really a change. The investment cast iron, because up to that okay. point, everything was forging. Yeah. So now, all of a sudden, the, the process lended itself to being able to move the weight around in a golf club, create a, create a, a cavity back. So, mm -hmm. yes, I would say that but i would i would really say the process of manufacturing okay. really lent itself to that uh, you know i would say for sure you're talking about the original big bertha for mm -hmm. sure 
Okay, that was the, that was that was a big change, you know. And if you want to go, you want to go back a long, long time. Steel shafts. I suppose, yeah. Yeah, from going from hickory to steel. Yeah. That was that was a massive change. It was a massive change in the way people swung the golf club. The ability to create a, a more consistent golf club because of the steel shafts. Yeah. So yeah. So I mean, I, you really can't take one. I mean, if you're really going to take one, you know, I, I probably probably the answer for sure. Yeah. I just it's it's still being it was used. So, it was so today. it was so different. Yeah. Than anything anybody ever saw before. Right. And no. it's still, I mean, how, how long ago was the first answer? I mean, 60, early 70s, I yeah. believe. And yeah, it's still, yeah. I, everybody's using them still. If you go out, once you watch a tour of it, I mean, so many people are still using that design. Yeah. I, or I something mean, that looks like it. I mean, I remember I was putting in, I was putting in high school and junior golf with, a, with an old bullseye. Yeah. You know, old bullseye my dad had, you know, flanged, nothing in, you know, was putting okay, but wasn't putting great. My, you know, my freshman year of high school, was at the club, I was at the golf course, and all of a sudden, it's sitting in the rack is this ping answer, and took it out and hit it, and sounded great because of the ping off that, yep. and started rolling it, and ended up buying it, and I don't even know, I don't even know how much it cost, maybe fifty nine, seventy nine dollar, whatever. That was a lot of money back then. I still have that. I still have that putter to today. Yeah, you know, and still every once in a while take it out. I mean, you're talking about something that that's 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's still a relevant design. Oh yeah. There's not many. There's not many products that that have lasted the test of time like that. Yeah, I can't think of. I mean, and that goes for not just in golf, but that goes for like other industries you yeah know, there's there's to see something as relevant as that putter head. yeah you don't see i mean i love persimmon woods you know that yeah. I'm, I'm a huge fan of persimmon woods but you don't see a pga tour player playing persimmon wood oh yeah but you could see a pga tour player going back and grabbing their 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 dad's old ping answer and mm -hmm. coming out and putt with it yeah. and nobody nobody would nobody would question no. it they'd still think that they still think it's a rel it still is a relevant technology yeah and at that time i mean it was really yeah really revolutionary yeah so i would i would go with the ping answer yeah. for sure all right last one Plus I've it's got the here. most cop probably the most copied golf club yeah right ever. that's kind of yeah, that was that's, kind of what I was. Yeah, know, that's the te to that's well. the testament to the design. Yeah, I mean, you, every well, you, other yeah. brand out there has something that looks a lot like a pink right. answer. Um, yeah. and it's you know that that blade with. Some I have one. I have one too. <laughs> <Yes>. Right. <laughs> but why wouldn't you? Yeah, because it's, because it's, it, it works. Is, it is it is, you know it's it's arguably the most iconic design, golf piece of golf equipment. Yeah, and for it works. Sure. Yeah. It works. So last one I have here. Uh, this is a kind of a fun one too from Jim, asking you to rank the 14 clubs in the bag, or I guess depending on how many clubs you have, but rank the clubs in the bag from most to least important. Ooh. Okay. Well, I would start with I would start with putter. Okay. Okay. Which makes sense. I knowing you, I know. I mean, we've well, been... it's it's 40 to 45 percent of your strokes. Yeah. How can it? How can it not be number one? Yeah, it's the That's, one. It's the one. One. It's the one that can lower your score the easiest. It's mm -hmm. the one that can change your handicap the most. It. Yeah. It is. It is. The round really evolves. Revolves around putting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. From in that statistics too. Drivers number two. You got to drive. You got to drive the ball in play. Mm -hmm. If I can't drive the ball in play. I'm struggling. Okay, that's gonna change. That's gonna change my score yeah. dramatically too. Is my ability to put the ball in the fairway, yeah. and I don't care if you put it 200 yards in the fairway or if you put it 320 in the fairway. Driving the ball consistently is it sets up a round. Okay, number three, it's got to be. It's got to be your most lofted wedge or the wedge the wedge that you use around the green. Okay. 
because from 50 yards and in, boy, if I'm good from 50 yards and in, now if I drive it in the trees, I can punch it. I'm, I don't have to hit a miracle shot. Right. I can punch it out, and if I can get it up and down from 50 yards, that I can make it. That saves a lot of strokes mm -hmm. rather than trying to hit it through the trees and knock it on the green because I'm not a good wedge player. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden I make six or seven. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, and if you look at stats between wedges, drivers, and putters, it's about 75% of your score. Right. I suppose. And then it's about 75% of your shots, maybe yeah. out of your well, score. Well, and, and I'm even thinking about my own game because I, yeah. I am that player that I will play my 58 degree, basically any shot, you know, 90 right. yards and in or whatever yeah. it is. Um, and which is a lot of holes for me as right. you know a longer player. Right. Any par four that's about, you know, under 400 yards, I'm probably hitting driver. And if it's in play, I'll take my 58 degree most yeah. of the time. Well, I mean, if you look at, you know, Dave Pels wrote the, the scoring, kind of the scoring Bible years ago. I mean, he took all, he took all this stuff down. I mean, he had players, he had players take their two iron out of their bag. Tour players take their two iron out of their bag. Every time it was a two iron shot, hit their six iron. And the players are like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Well, they hit it up around the green and being good wedge players they are, they actually ended up making par more pars than when they hit their two iron because they hit their two iron in trouble yeah. in a bunker. Or they hit it in the water, did whatever. So, you know, I mean, he was the first one that kind of said, well, gee, take out every other club, play your woods, play your wedges, take out every other iron, and you're going to find out that you actually are going to score just as good or maybe even yeah. better. Yeah. So, I mean, that's where, I mean, he was the one the first one to bring it really to people's attention. I mean, tour players knew it in the past without some, but there's the information that comes out and says, hey, this is this is what matters. You know, mm -hmm. Trevino, came, Trevino came out there, you know, there's an Instagram and he was, he was talking, I saw this about a month ago, he was talking, somebody asked him a question, he goes, hey, he goes, I got so good because I, I worked at and grew up at a place where there was a driving range and there was a little there was a little nine hole executive par three. He goes, I went over the driving range, learned how to drive it good, went over the went over the little nine hole, learned how to wedge it good, and then you know what? And then he goes, if you can if you can learn how to roll it with the putter, he goes, that's why I was so good. Yeah. People didn't people didn't know that, you know. So we, you know, as fitters, we spend a lot of time with people, irons, yeah. fairway woods, hybrids. Not that they're not important because you want them to hit. But, I mean, if I'm really going to focus on my game, I'm going, I'm going putter, I'm going driver, I'm going wedges. Probably the next section is iron play yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. because you're hitting irons, you want to hit a good shot on a par three, you want to hit a good shot after you've hit. So I would say irons, and then probably, you know, for me, it's probably, in even yourself, I mean, now you look at fairway woods and fairway woods, hybrids, where does that really fit in? What do I really need right. to do with that? Well, and, and it's, they're just not used as often in most cases. Right? No, and but if, if I'm a high-speed guy like you, Gee, I might want a three wood that I can hit off the tee really yeah. well. That kind of becomes, you know, it almost be kind of in in PGA Tour players like this. It's almost like driver A and driver B. My driver A is the one that I can hit the farthest, right? Yeah. My driver B is kind of like, oh, fairway this is finder. A, yeah, this is my fairway finder. You know, hey, Taylor Maid's back out with a mini driver mm -hmm. again, and you see some guys throwing it in their bag because. Hey, I don't need to hit 320, but I want to hit this 280 down the middle right. of the fairway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I would look at it that way. So it, it's kind of not like you can't really rank the irons and fairway woods individually. But, yeah, I, I would, yeah, I'd go putter, driver, wedges, irons, yeah, and then fairway woods, and hybrids sure. are, are at the bottom yeah. of that. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense just based on the number of times it's used. And, and, and I think if there, any golfer were to... And this is any golfer where to look at number of times used 
in those categories. I mean, that would all bear itself well, out. Well, if you stand on a golf, you stand on a golf hole, and I'll give you a golf hole that I play all the time, which is you know the 11th hole at Chaska. I mean, it's a difficult par four. Yes, it's mm-hmm. long. It's got water on the left. It's got out of bounds on the right. It's got a grove of trees that you can drive in the fairway and get blocked out. So it's not an easy golf hole. You know, I hit a drive there. You know, I've got a a fairly long club into that green. Mm -hmm. So most of the time I play right because the water's left all the way up to the green. So I'll play right of that. And, you know, if I hit a really good shot, I might be able to draw it and get the front of the green. But I don't mind missing that green to the right-hand side because I know I got a really good chance of getting it up and down. Okay, so think about this. If, If I don't have a short game, and I'm standing out there. Now I'm trying with a long club with maybe a fairway wood or a hybrid or a longer iron. I'm standing out there worried because I know the only chance of making par is for me to hit this on your on the green. Yeah. Well, that's a tremendous amount of pressure yeah. on that you don't trust shot. The short game. You don't trust your short game. Well, then you draw it back all the way back to the tee. Well, if I don't hit this drive perfectly, if mm-hmm. I'm in trouble and I have to punch out, I don't have a chance of making, you know, that's why the short game is so, because it takes so much pressure off your longer game. Yeah. It really takes pressure off your iron game. I mean, if you're standing out there with a six or a seven or a five iron on a hole and you know, hey, I'm going to hit this. Well, if I miss the green, I, I'm still not worried because I know I can get yeah. it up and down. Right. If I know that, if I'm stressing about my short game and know that I can't make a par if I miss the green because I'm a bad chipper, that's not any fun. Mm-hmm. And that makes it hard. That's, that's where you're wasting a lot of shots. Yeah. You know, I, I, play with some, I played with some older guys at, at Bluff Creek, and, you know, some of their short games are not <laughs> up to par, you know, for a term, but... And they, they freak out because the, when they miss the green, it's like, well, I know I can't make par. Well, that's a hard way to play golf. <laughs> yeah, right? it sure is. Yeah, I mean, it just puts a lot of... It, and, and to me, it's the easy... You know, nobody likes practice in putting. Nobody likes practice in wedge play. But it's done... You know, it's not hard on your back. It's not hard on your body. It doesn't take a lot of physical strength to get really good from 50 yards, to Mm -hmm. sit there at the range and have a target at, say, 45 to 50 yards and try to land it there every time. How many times do you see people doing that at the driving range? Not a lot. It's always... Zero, you know. Drivers. And well, if it, if I'm there, I'm the only guy that's doing it. I can tell you that. All yeah. the all the other golf balls, you know, they're worried about how far this is going, how far. That's all great. I mean, that's that's a good part of the game that we have now, is the ability to track how far we hit everything easily. But on the other side of it, why aren't we tracking, hitting 45, 50 yard shots? Mm-hmm. Where, you know, hey, laying up on a par five. I always try to lay up to a specific yardage, so I might hit, I might not hit my three wood down by the green and leave myself in an awkward yardage. Yeah. I might lay up at 90, I, you know, I try to lay up somewhere 90, 85, 90 yards all the time, because that to me is a comfortable middle wedge on the green, and I'm gonna hit a good solid shot, and I know no matter where the pin is, I can bring it in with height and spin. Yeah. yeah. Course management. Mm-hmm. It's playing that way. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's that's where I think so many people could do so much better in their golf game by doing less. Yeah. By trying to be less aggressive to try and, and it's, you know, hey, it's boring. I mean, it, you know, it, 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 it there's not a lot of excitement, but you know what? Boring golf is good golf most of the time. Boring golf is good golf most yeah, of the time. And yeah. Boring golf, boring golf turns into now it turns into a lot more fun. Your handicap goes down. Your mm-hmm. scoring gets better, and you know you you just like to see people do. I mean, the kids at the university, you know, on the men's golf team, we're trying to get them to play boring golf. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You know, they hit at three forty. They hit at three fifty. I mean, it is it is so. 
if, if you have an ego about how far you hit it, I don't care anymore because I'm old, but you know, you're standing out at 195 yards. I'm hitting, I'm hitting five wood and these kids are hitting seven iron. Yeah. I mean, but they're 40 years younger than I am and yeah. they, you know, flexible and flexible and they work kids. out, obviously, you know, there's not <laughs> a lot of workout going on here, <laughs> but you know, that's where the that's where the games change a yep. lot. But still, at the end of the day, you got to get in in the hole. Yeah, yep, yeah. It's it's golf. It's not the long drive contest. So, um, Mr. Bobka, this has been great. Part two is uh, complete. Here, we'll do another one here soon. Uh, Perfect. We'll get no, more yeah. questions. We'll get more comments. Um, yeah. No, love to answer the questions because, you know, there's a there's a lot of things. If, you know, as we talk about doing these things, I mean, there's a lot of things that I think about, and you know. I just take some stuff for granted because I've done this for so long right. that, you know, it's like, well, what do you mean you don't understand this? Or, yeah. what, well, it's because well, it's, it's like my life. Yeah, so. yeah. You, it's, it's second nature to you. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, and there, there's, in, you know, I, I would encourage anybody to just answer. There, there are no stupid questions, yeah. you know. You know, um, especially now based on how the games change the way Clubs have changed the game, the way the balls changed the game. Um, but still, at the end of the day, you got to get it in the hole. But there's a lot of things out there that, you know, and, and hey, we see a lot of things on the Internet. There's a lot of marketing. I mean, yeah. honestly, you could say if you've gone to the PGA show for many years, as I have, I should be driving at about 700 yards right now because everybody's <laughs> golf ball's gotten longer. Everybody's club's gotten longer, yeah. since, you know, since... I've gone to 40 some PGA shows. I mean, you'd think I'd be hitting at 700 yards. Well, yeah. I don't. But that's where that's answering questions yeah. like this, I hopefully that can help people yeah. kind of understand what they need for their games and mm -hmm. help them get better. Yeah. Well, um, and of course, listeners and viewers, you can schedule a fitting with Larry um, if you're in the Twin Cities area at the Minnetonka store. Otherwise, any of our fitters in any of our stores will take care of you the way Larry does. So thank you, Larry, for the time. You're welcome. Uh, another great segment here, and we'll do this again here soon. Perfect.